Welcome everyone. Was the lunch good? Did we all get to get some coffee, get some good food? Excellent. Well, let's start with coffee then, because coffee is uh, what well, definitely keeps me going after uh, after quite a journey to uh, to get here. So, when you got your coffee today, the moment you got it out of what, probably the giant jug filled with coffee, you didn't have to think about the whole process, about the farmer that harvested uh, the, the coffee beans, the process of actually brewing the coffee. All you did was pull the lever, and as long as you didn't forget to put your cup underneath, you got your coffee. So, in a nutshell, that's abstraction. And with that, that was my session. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. You're still here, so I guess we're going to fill up the other 44 and a half minutes. So my name is Jaap. Uh, I've been playing around with PowerShell for quite some time now. Uh, see, see quite some familiar faces here. Uh, I'm currently uh, working as a developer advocate uh, at Harness. Actually, today is day one. So just started a new job today, and they sent me here. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy. Uh, other than that, uh, I still like writing a fair bit of uh, fair bit of code. I do the occasional speaking, although unfortunately it's been a lot of online. So I'm very happy to be here. So uh, yeah, is this a first conference for everyone here as well? I'd say about 50, 50, maybe a little bit more. Um, yeah. So my background is I, uh, I come from an IT infrastructure uh, background. I've been working as an engineer, uh, IT consultant for over 10 years uh, before I became a developer advocate. And that's also where my passion for PowerShell comes from. It's, I've been using it. Uh, I got sick of keep on clicking the same buttons to get something done. Started scripting it. And the moment you start doing that, you kind of start to get hooked. And after a while, you try to find different ways of doing it. And I guess that's how I ended up here today, to talk about abstraction. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask all of you, <coughs> I was explicitly told I can't walk in front of the screen. So if I do that, just shout out my name so I know that I stop. So let's try it out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Cool, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to give a short introduction about abstractions and also what I mean by it and what I'm going to uh, talk about because it's, it's a broad concept. It's uh, in, the, in the basis of computing in general. Uh, everything is abstractions up on layers of abstractions. Uh, then I'll talk about how it applies to PowerShell. And I'll show some examples of uh, abstractions that I've built. and what they can do for you and how you can, uh, after the initial ramp up phase, get to a stage where you can write your code more quickly because of your initial investment in abstracting a bit of code. Um, talk a bit about when to use it and then, of course, demos. And I'll try to leave some time for Q&A. So is that uh, in line with what everyone wants? Excellent. Otherwise. Kalgadi is next door, then we can all go there. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So abstraction in computing, I already mentioned, it's, uh, it's uh, basically the essence of computing. Because in the end, it's all ones and zeros. And it isn't even really ones and zeros, because it's all electrical circuits. And ones and zeros are just a concept that we came up with. So that's already an abstraction. So let's look at some of the building blocks. Why do we have computers? We have computers because we're lazy. It has a bit of a negative connotation, but I've learned to embrace my laziness, and I like to use automations to make my life easier. So laziness, uh, abstractions are just building blocks. Um, one abstraction is layered on top of the other, and eventually you get to a level where you're comfortable level where I'm very comfortable, and I think most of you as well, is PowerShell. And from there, we slowly get to the point where we get to a programming language or a scripting, uh, scripting language. And with that, we get to PowerShell. 
So this was uh, a crowd at uh, the PowerShell Conference Europe. This is three years ago. I think this is the, well, it's not the last big conference I, uh, I was at, but they're definitely throwing the, the PowerShell uh, signs out there. So PowerShell itself is already an abstraction layered on top of a lot of abstractions. Most notably .NET, uh, because a lot of the objects that we use in PowerShell are actually .NET objects, but there's also different layers underneath uh, aside, from, uh, aside from just .NET. So even within uh, the PowerShell language itself, we have the commandlets. When we're using a commandlet, we need to know about the parameters, the arguments. I think Jason this morning uh, showed a nice example of uh, what is coming up in PowerShell, that we can press the F1 button, so we can actually do interactive help. I thought it was quite a nice, uh, qu quite a nice feature. It also ties in this story. Because the moment you have a one-liner and you're using PS read line, you no longer have to think about the fact which arguments are, am I going to put in which parameters because you can just press the up our arrow or, uh, or just go back to one of the commands that you previously executed. If you have a number of one-liners or you have a specific function that uh, uh, a, a, spe a specific number of commands, you can wrap them together in a function and then you can just call that function uh, or and you can put those together in a, in a script and eventually into a module. So you can abstract your code in that, uh, in that way as well. But what I really want to get into today is not just the commandlets, the, the one-liners, the functions, the scripts, but it's uh, writing code in such a way that uh, you, you create a framework so you can minimize the amount of code you have to write after you have uh, written that initial framework. And in the most optimal scenario, you wouldn't have to write that because it already exists. There's quite a couple of good, uh, good ones out there. I also mentioned them uh, today. Um, but it's not suitable for, uh, for every scenario. And it comes with some complications uh, as well. Because it can, uh, it can make it easier to add functionality, and I'll show why in a bit. It can, uh, it, you can make sure that you don't have to copy-paste copy code around, because that's how, uh, how I started writing modules. The moment you have one function or one commandlet that you're happy with, you're like, okay, this is pretty good. I'm going to put this in a special folder or I'll call it template.ps1, and whenever I need a new function, I'll just copy-paste that one. I mean, it works, but if there's a better way of doing it, then we should go for the better way. Um, I found it uh, to speed up, uh, speed up development, and also it can help to uh, simplify contributions for other people that are working on your, uh, uh, on your module, in case you're sharing it either with colleagues or you place it, uh, place it up on GitHub. Why wouldn't you do it? And that's a bit of the double-edged sword that you have when you're going to be abstracting your code. It can also, uh, it, it will definitely increase your ramp up time because just copy-pasting a one-liner into a function and calling that your function is pretty easy to do and something we're most likely all familiar with. It add, can add to the complexity, in at least the initial, uh, initial complexity. Uh, it can require additional documentation because if you write a fancy abstraction layer on top of, uh, on, on top of your module, then people that want to contribute might not immediately understand. So it can complicate contributions. Luckily, there is also a solution for this. If you're using GitHub, uh, for those that are not aware, there's uh, contributions.md, uh, and unfortunately it's not on a lot of repositories. So if you're ever uh, creating a GitHub project and you want people to contribute, make sure you use uh, contributing.md and tell people how they can contribute and how your, uh, 
how your module or your script or collection of scripts uh, works, so you can get people uh, can, can get people started with that. So I already mentioned there's different ways uh, of doing this. So initially, you can just write your code. You can copy paste your code around to create new functions for your module or uh, for multiple mo modules. You can have a function that write the functions for you. So then you don't have to copy paste yourself. You can just give some parameters to your function and it will create a function for you. That's a pretty, uh, pretty neat approach as well. Uh, and then the last one, that's at least the level that I'm at, is have a function that generate the function itself. Or the function just looks at a data source and then based on the data, the function will know what to do. So it's a bit abstract, but that's why we're in uh, this session. Are you still with me? Um, I should have said this at the start, but if you have any questions during the session, you can just raise your hand. Um, I don't mind being interrupted. So, so with that, let's go look at uh, some examples of what you can do with it. So for today, I have uh, two examples. Uh, personally, I've been working a lot with, uh, with APIs um, in recent years, so, uh, mostly web, uh, web APIs. And the nice thing about APIs is uh, it doesn't matter if you're using REST APIs or, uh, or GraphQL, they're all very structured. So they really lend themselves for easy, um, uh, uh, for, for easy abstractions, because you can just use the, uh, the schema of the, uh, of the API endpoints to generate your functions on. This can be a good thing, and it can also be a bad thing. Uh, I recently, uh, th th this is not for a web API, but I recently saw a tweet of a uh, official, uh, official commandlet that was 157 characters long. It was one of those automatically generated uh, uh, commandlets released by a pretty big software company. And automatically generating things is not always great. So that's, uh, it's a bit, of a bit of a pitfall. But uh, when you're building an API wrapper, the reason you would do that is because just doing invoke web request or invoke REST method um, it's pretty easy to do initially, but it can easily become uh, it can easily become more complex. So you can write uh, commandlets around it. Uh, you can make sure that you can actually pipe the results of one API endpoint into the other, and those are the kind of abstractions that are actually useful when you're uh, when you're writing that. You can parse the data because when you get the data out there, it's usually in JSON, hopefully in JSON, but I've also seen cases where it's JSON and then some of the fields are filled with HTML. And that always makes me feel really, really dirty if I have to deal with that, so. <laughs> and you can put uh, exception handling in there. So you can account for user error. And the nice thing about PowerShell is, of course, that you can also uh, use shoot process. And you can include things like verbose, debug, uh, what if, uh, and confirm for commands that, or for API calls that require that, or where you think it would be useful. So you can guide the user through their interactions with an API, rather than having them figure it out. And the advantage for that is, uh, not everyone is a developer. I'm not a developer. Are there any developers here? Couple of developers here. So. For people who are developers, probably very comfortable working with APIs. I wasn't when I got started with it, uh, but having some uh, PowerShell commandlets to work with it, having that familiar syntax can really simplify uh, how you work with it. And with that, let's go look at some code. What we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to start easy, and then we're going to work our way to uh, more complex examples, because just Calling uh, invoke REST method is, of course, easy, but you need to be able to authenticate. You need to be able to do error handling. So I'll walk uh, everyone through that. And 
Ah, and I'm also using one of those MacBooks, so that's a, that's a nice thing of, um, uh, of PowerShell since it's been open sourced. We can actually run everything here. Um, give me a second, I'll make it bigger and I'll make it brighter. This is not a, is that better? Too bright? I don't want to wake you up. I mean, it is after lunch, so. Yes, I'm trying to figure out how to do it on the Mac. It's control. Uh, command plus, there we go. A little bit too much. Ah, well, I can make this work. Is that visible in the back as well? Cool. So we're going to start easy. Um, this is the, the one API. It's the API for Lord of the Rings because I figured the Star Wars one and the Star Trek one, they're a little bit overused. Also, I don't know the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek, so I would be the wrong person. <laughs> I have to be careful. I know I'm in the US, I might be shot, so. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started with the first API call. And That is, of course, great if I'm not connected to Wi-Fi. So in the meantime, <laughs> so what I'm about to show here is uh, we're going to do an API call. And that API call will give us back an object. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, starting from PowerShell 6, we'll be able to uh, 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 the invoke REST method automatically converts it into, uh, into a PowerShell object. When using Windows PowerShell, this was not the case. And that also complicated, uh, uh, it, it was also a bit more complicated when it came to uh, working with web commandlets because there were some exceptions with, uh, with JSON parsing where it just didn't do it right. And it would flatten out objects, it wouldn't go to full depth, or it would put in arrays where they shouldn't be arrays, or it would flatten arrays where they should be there. So that's something to take into account. If you're ever working with, uh, with Windows PowerShell and you get weird bugs, or it doesn't work the way it works in PowerShell 6 or 7, uh, that's why. And he's unfortunately not here at the conference, but uh, Mark, uh, Mark Kraus is uh, one of the folks that uh, contributed a lot to that. So with this, uh, we can see we get back an object, but we can't read the information yet because it's all contained in docs. So what we can do is we can just dig into the object. We can see there's the three books there in the correct order. You see it also has an ID. So what we do in the next one, we just query directly for the ID, and then we should be able to get only the book that we want. So we can see that works as well. And if we want to get the characters, we could do that in a similar way as well. So the basics of working with an API is very simple, but it becomes more complex when you have to authenticate against it. And if you're authenticating against an API, what are you going to use? Are you going to go for basic authentication? Are you going for token-based authentication? One of the, one of the pitfalls I've seen with people. Uh, the, the, uh, let, let's start just by asking. Is base64 encryption, yes or no? OK, thank you. Because the amount of times where I've seen people just copy over their connection string in either a GitHub issue or in a company-wide chat, it's like I, mo most people don't understand that they just shared their password. So that, uh, I'm, I'm glad I have a good audience here. So in this case, uh, I have one, uh, one commandlet here, a function. So it's about getting some cluster upgrade history. Uh, in order to be able to run this, we're going to, need, uh, we're going to need an API token. So if we want that, we can, and let's hide PowerShell for now. We can do that. And in order to do that, you can see that it quite quickly becomes more complex because uh, what I mentioned before, you have Windows PowerShell and you have uh, PowerShell 6. 
um, having to account for the fact that, uh, and that's uh, this part here, uh, that in uh, older version of Windows, Power, uh, Windows PowerShell and Windows itself, the TOS uh, 1.2 is not enabled, and that would break authentication for most modern uh, most modern APIs. Also, the PowerShell gallery. If you ever got uh, an exception with that, then that's uh, that's the same one. Uh, but I won't dig too much into this one. It's just to show that you can have username, password. You can have a credential object, and you can authenticate with a token. And there's a lot of logic that goes into that one as well. That's not the abstraction that I uh, want to dig into though. So let's take a look at this command set. We can see this one doesn't take any parameters. And we can see that all it does is get API data and it uh, says the name of the function. So it says I want the API data for my uh, for myself, for this function. So then we can go into API data. What we can see here is we have get cluster upgrade history. We can see we have a number of numbers here. So you can account for the different versions of an API. And it will give back uh, which URI it is. So in this case, it's API P1. Uh, we have 1.1, and in 1.1, the only difference is that there's a different status code. And uh, we can see that in uh, 5.0, it changed to a v2 endpoint instead of a v1 endpoint. And what you can do by uh, abstracting or removing that uh, from your commandlet, you can simplify the code of your commandlet by having a source of truth outside of your command load. So you don't have to build the logic in, and you can abstract it away in that way. Diving in a little bit further, so um, in order to get uh, the information from the server, instead of just running invoke web request and just seeing if it sticks, uh, there, there's a separate command load, uh, to submit the request. It's not, uh, it's not a valid verb, and I am aware of that. You, do, do you want to know what my favorite workaround is whenever I want to use unapproved verbs, but I don't want, uh, I don't want VS Code to get upset with me? Sure. What? Sure. Sure? So you just use invoke or whatever, and then you put the alias in there. And the alias can be whatever. It doesn't have to be an approved verb. So that's my, uh, that's my favorite workaround to not make, uh, not make VS Code upset. Because sometimes the non-approved verbs just make more sense. Um, with that one, uh, the most interesting uh, part of this one is in order to deal with the exceptions that, uh, that, PowerShell, uh, that Windows PowerShell causes. Uh, you can see here that uh, if it's PowerShell 6 or later, then we're going to use convert from JSON, and it will just works. Uh, it will just work as intended. And in case we're working with uh, PowerShell uh, Windows PowerShell, we're going to use expand payload. So there we go, another unapproved uh, verb, and it's in invoke expand payload. And we can see that instead of using uh, instead of using the uh, convert from JSON in Windows PowerShell, we can, uh, we can use the system.web extensions. So that was my best workaround for Windows PowerShell to still do semi-decent uh, semi -decent parsing. The other, uh, the other workaround is using the Newton, uh, uh, Newton JSON uh, converter that's also included in PowerShell 6. You can import it in Windows PowerShell, but. And with that, that's the part of the demo. Let's go back. The most important part is loading current slide. There we go. So doing an API request is pretty easy, but once you start to get, uh, once you start to get into the things, 
it becomes more complex because of the differences between different uh, versions of PowerShell. So it's only really easy if you use PowerShell 6 or later. It can also grow complex based on what kind of API endpoints you have, whether you're talking to the one API or you're talking against an enterprise API that might be versioned and you might have people that expect to talk to different versions of an API. But the complexity can be abstracted away because you can either just use uh, the API schema itself or you can use multiple API schemas and you can maintain that as the source of truth rather than uh, putting it all inside of your uh, functions or commandlets. So this is if you want to do it yourself. But as I was looking into what other people uh, put together, uh, I really like the solution that uh, James, uh, I forgot his last name. Yes, I really, I really like your, uh, your, your abstraction. And that's my next, uh, my, my next point. Sometimes you don't have to write them, you don't have to write them yourself because in the PS DevOps uh, module, uh, the one that I particularly liked uh, was the connect GitHub uh, commandlet and I got a bit of code and it's awesome that uh, I have the writer of the code in the room as well. And it's this bit of code that will take all the information from the GitHub API, that's what's on top there, api.github.json. It, uh, it, will, it will iterate through the, uh, through the JSON file and it will create all the commandlets and uh, you'll be able to call it by just calling the GitHub uh, name. The only thing to keep in mind is that there is, of course, another commandlet there that actually takes it as input and that one is significantly bigger than this one. But that's, that's the beauty of abstraction and sometimes you don't have to write it yourself. Uh, sometimes I like to write it myself, but it, uh, uh, in order to be lazy, it's nice that it's there. Yeah. So the new module, like the import module at the bottom. Yeah. If it's sort of great to be able to just say, hey, here's a non official PowerShell name, but it'll run the official PowerShell command. But if you want to bring them in after you've already brought in the module, after you, but you, you're importing X prior to Z, and now you want some other command to create the variance for you, this is how you do it. You can basically create a dynamic module. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. The, the other part that I like about APIs, and after that I'm going to stop with APIs and talk about a bit more, more of an infrastructure uh, thing, Windows that is, is the fact that because APIs are structured, it also can be quite easy to, uh, to generate documentation based on that. With REST, it's quite easy. Uh, I recently found uh, a nice module to also do it with GraphQL. GraphQL is uh, a different, uh, different way to query where REST has all the different endpoints like slash character, slash book with the one API. With GraphQL you have a single endpoint and you query against that endpoint. And one of the things that I did was I used a CD uh, pipeline to just continuously deploy whenever a new piece of uh, a new definition of GraphQL is released, immediately deploy the documentation without me having to step in between because I like to automate things away so I don't have to uh, worry about it myself. And with that, let's talk about uh, Windows 11. Is anyone already using Windows 11? I'd say more than half of the people and some people holding up their uh, laptops or tablet, I don't know what it was. One of the things that I immediately uh, slightly disliked was the fact that if I right clicked on something, I, I would get the context menu where I couldn't zip and unzip things directly and that's something that I do quite often. So I started to take a look and it turns out that there's no, uh, th there was no button there, but you could do it with a registry tweak. So pretty easy to implement, also pretty easy to, 
write a function for, or well, it's not even a function, it's just a one-liner. Uh, but the taskbar was also centered, so I figured, you know what, I'm bored. I don't have many friends. Also, it was lockdown time, so what was I to do? <laughs> so I decided to, uh, to write a module for this. Um, but as I started uh, writing the module, I wanted to do the same as I did with uh, what I've done previously with APIs. And that was to make a generic config so it would become uh, easier to add commands in there. So I wouldn't have to copy paste every, uh, every function whenever I wanted to add new functionality uh, in there. So to give you an idea of how it works, uh, in this case the taskbar, because it's easier to show, can do uh, set taskbar in center and then disable and then you can see it moves to the left. This one's also a good example because not all of the uh, not all of the registry tweaks are immediately applied when you change them. For some of them you have to kill explorer and that doesn't look as nice. So let's see what uh, what I could have done and how I made things more complex but I thought at least pretty interesting uh, in regards to abstracting it. So let's go into demo two. Is everyone familiar with splatting? Cool, then I don't have to explain that one. Why? Well, I guess not everyone said yes. So splatting is when you put things in a, uh, in a hash table and then you use the splat operator, uh, which in PowerShell is the at sign. Um, and you inject uh, the parameters directly into the command. Uh, why this is nice, I'll also show that in the function. If I would run this, uh, it would uh, change the registry key. But for the attentive viewers here, I'm on a MacBook, so obviously this won't work. So we'll just talk about uh, what we have here. So here we have our one-liner, new item property. I put it in a splat just to put it on multiple uh, lines so it's uh, easy, easily readable. If we want to put this in a function, we can do this quite easily. We have enable, we have disable. You can put the splat in there with uh, all, the, uh, all the commands that are the same for both enable and disable. And we can set value uh, one or zero. Uh, I mistyped that one. So enable is one, disable is zero. There we go and then put it into the registry. So that's a simple function, and I could have left it at that, and then whenever I wanted to add something new, just update the registry key, but I wanted to make it slightly nicer than that. So let's go take a look at uh, what my solution for, uh, for this was. And we'll go into get taskbar. So here we go. So all we have in the commandlet itself is, of course, documentation, because we, we need to have some documentation. One of the nice things of PowerShell. Uh, we have enable, disable, and the only thing that is in any function is invoke configuration data. Uh, yeah, I didn't know which verb to use, so whenever you don't know which verb to use, you just go for invoke. <laughs> So let's go take a look what uh, invoke configuration data does for us. So I put a one in private. You can see here that it does a lot. It has a switch where it takes a look at what the calling commandlet is. So how do we get the calling commandlet? Well, we get that one from uh, the parameter at the top. So we do a regex against it, so we see whether it's a get or a set, because currently I only have get and set uh, enabled. And then it iterates to what uh, the possibilities are. And what we have is we have a data file, and we have a separate data file for every, uh, for every commandlet. I could have also chosen to put it in uh, one giant data file, but it 
I figured it was easier to edit and easier to see where something was by throwing it in different files. So then we go take a look at uh, the taskbar, taskbar in center. So we can see that we don't have get or set, we just have taskbar in center. And ba uh, this one works for both the get and the set commandlet because it can use the information that is in here, the registry key in this case. It knows when it's enabled and when it's disabled based on the information in here. So it really simplifies uh, how, you, uh, how you can create your commandlets. And because I don't like copy-pasting things anymore, I also put in uh, some scripts. And this folder is called local script. And before I pushed it to GitHub, I was sure to make sure that I excluded uh, the local script uh, from, uh, from being pushed up to GitHub by putting it in ignore. But then when I published my module, uh, I kind of forgot that everything was in there. So everything was still pushed there. So that's, I guess that's why you need to have a good pipeline to deploy your stuff and not just really nilly just do it yourself because in the end I'm still, uh, well, I'm still, I'm very much human and I make a lot of mistakes. And then we have invoke generate commandlet because generate is not uh, an approved verb, so. And I have all the function information uh, in here and the basic documentation is in there. So whenever I generate a new commandlet and uh, uh, put this into, uh, into a file, then all I need to do is, if there is going to be multiple, um, uh, multiple parameters, aside from enable or disable, I'll have to add that in there. And I guess I could automate that as well, but in the end, I thought this was uh, pretty good. And with that, uh, whenever there's a change to uh, anything that happens in the registry, or I take uh, one of those big GP, uh, uh, GPO templates that has all those registry values, I can just generate a whole list of command lists based on that, and it becomes pretty easy to keep up to date and to, uh, to work with. And with that, going back to the slides. That was a mistake. There we go. So what we saw, it was a pretty, pretty simple, uh, uh, pretty simple task. I mean, just changing a registry value. I think we're all comfortable with that. But you can build a framework for that and have a uh, a reusable solution for whenever you want to write something uh, to a structured set of data, in this case the registry, and you can minimize the amount of code that you need to have in your functions, and that also makes uh, testing in your code a lot simpler, and whenever someone wants to contribute uh, to this module, all they need to understand is the fact there's some JSON files that are in this data folder. Whenever I want to add a commandlet, I just put it in there, you could even uh, include it into your, uh, into your pipeline that it just generates the functions the moment uh, there's, a new, uh, there's a new JSON file in there. And yeah, that just makes, uh, makes life a bit easier. So wrapping up, uh, abstracting code can be expensive. Not expensive in a monetary value, but it can be time consuming, so it can be expensive in that sense. Uh, it isn't always suitable, so if you're, uh, if you're working on something that uh, is high priority, um, well, good example, well, terrible example, you, you have ransomware going on in your organization and you just want to know what you can do or what kind of systems are affected, then definitely don't try to abstract your code or write a nice framework. Do it afterwards, don't do it at the moment it's happening. Uh, there are great examples online. Uh, I'm very happy James is here because I'm definitely going to pick his brain afterwards. Uh, it can, and it can simplify uh, writing the code and uh, um, uh, writing the code and also simplify uh, getting contributions into your, uh, into your module. 
And with that, I'd like to leave it with, uh, well, my parents' dog, but I claim him as my dog. Any questions? Uh, so the API example is something that I uh, that I did professionally. Uh, this one I have contributors. Uh, Mike over there has uh, contributed to it, at least in the sense. Mike. Yeah. Yes, you contributed. <laughs> so we, we do something similar. Mm -hmm. I, th I think once you start to have bigger modules and people are trying to contribute, they might not follow the exact, uh, the exact guidelines of, of a module. So what I do when it's a smaller project is just take like 15 minutes and talk them through the process. But uh, yeah, if people would read the documentation and you have the documentation there, uh, it, should, uh, it should not be necessary. Any other questions? Does make sense. So your question is, at, right. at what at, at what moment do you? Trigger that usually tells you I need to add another level to that if you're doing something more natural like that. Um, yeah, I guess the best answer I have it really <laughs> depends on the situation. For uh, I I don't think there's like a, a set uh, a set moment when I decide okay now I need to abstract it either one level, uh, one level further. Uh, if I, in the ideal scenario, I, I have the time to take a look at a problem. Like the registry one was a pretty simple one because yeah, you're just dealing with the registry and that is just always there. And you know what it looks like because it's been the same for 25 years. So in that case, it's quite easy. But uh, in enterprise scenarios where you're dealing with a lot of systems, uh, I, I guess realistically, whenever I run into problems, then I start looking at, okay, do I want to just add this in this function? Is that going to be the lightest load? Or am I going to incur technical depth by doing so? And I should just make sure that there's either a layer of abstraction or a separate function that will deal with the exceptions. Uh, Yeah. Then you started building more on top of that, and then mm -hmm. more on top of that, and eventually you realize, okay, I need to sort of reconfigure this entire setup so that while there is more complexity in the abstraction, the end result is actually a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. Uh, in in this case, uh, because it was the registry. Uh, it is actually expandable beyond the registry. That's why it explicitly states that as well in the JSON file, if it is registry. It would be able to do different functions as well. But uh, it's, it's, it's all very structured and like self-contained. In, in the real world, it, uh, it's, it's, the real world is messy, like <laughs> was mentioned earlier today. James.
that's a that's a good comment. Thank you. And with that, I think. Oh, sorry. Yes. That is also a good uh, good point. Yes, if you if you put the abstraction outside of the the local system and you connect to either a database, a web server, or whatever, you can uh, you can update code without uh, uh, without having to push it. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your time. I think we're uh, about at the hour.